Okay, so this evening uh, we are going to spend a few minutes at the beginning just to talk about uh, the last topic uh, that was a leftover from last week uh, uh, about uh, different kinds of uh, prototyping techniques uh, and uh, the so-called uh, wisest of all uh, techniques uh, that are, uh, are is useful you know, if you want uh, uh, to test uh, in a way like in a prototype so put into the hand of the users some kind of technologies that you really don't have or uh, you would like to pretend you have it but actually you, you don't or it's something that maybe will come in the future okay so uh, especially if this kind of technology is not uh, um, is not something familiar with your users so the user will not uh, for example imagine you are trying to test uh, i don't know some uh, um, voice interaction okay like uh, an alexa speaker or a google home speaker and something like that right now we have these these uh, objects and we know how to interact with them we know we have some direct experience uh, at least a lot of people do have a, a direct experience with some these kind of devices but at the beginning uh, nobody ever had uh, any experience nobody had any idea of how it felt uh, you know, speaking with the device so how can you uh, do some kind of prototype testing uh, you cannot do that on paper because it's all any maybe voice oriented you can do that by you know voice messages because you, you don't know what how, how how the system will understand you and what is the response and so on so in those cases uh, uh, we could uh, uh, say set up a, a sort of a fake experiment when uh, you are uh, letting some user experiment uh, in real time in an interactive way with a uh, with a user interface that maybe uses some technologies that don't exist yet uses some in algorithms some maybe intelligence that doesn't exist yet or is not finalized finalized yet um, and you don't have the code you don't have the implementation for that uh, maybe you have some sort of a of a prop, some sort of a partial prototype, uh, but no intelligence, no logic behind that. And so the idea is, uh, uh, you know, to to let the user interact with something that uh, looks like it's intelligent, but it's really dumb. Why the intelligence is hidden somewhere else? Hmm? So, for example, uh, maybe you're familiar with this uh, mechanical Turk, which was a, a sort of a, a machine playing chess with uh, against humans and so this uh, actually was a was a puppet with a was a machine uh, that was uh, moving chess pieces on the board and was winning uh, games and uh, all of that was uh, activated by mechanical gear uh, here okay so but the, so the real story is that there was a very small person hiding here uh, behind and this was the person moving all the all the levers moving all the gears and actually playing the game okay but it was hidden the impression of the this was of course uh, used in fairs in uh, in shows uh, no for for entertainment entertainment purposes uh, the people imagine the user sitting there trying to play chess against this uh, this uh, puppet um, the uh, people will, would feel like they were interacting with an intelligent machine while the real interaction was with a human that was carefully hiding uh, from uh, from the uh, from the real user so actually in, in a way we are simulating we are, let's get down to our kind of interfaces uh, we are simulating our interface that uh, maybe requires some kind of new interaction some kind of new intelligence some kind of artificial intelligence or whatever uh, that we don't have implemented yet or maybe some image recognition some sound some voice recognition and uh, we are not able today you know, to integrate that in our prototype even if uh, we would be able probably to integrate that in the final product so for the moment being we would we could trick the users into believing uh, that this uh, technology is already available or at least during the experimentation it looks like it's working by hiding a person <laughs> a real person uh, uh, somewhere and letting this person to respond in, in a way uh, to um, to the user actions so in this way the um, the, the user has the impression of uh, speaking with the machine while it's really speaking to a human so for example let's go back to the example of the voice uh, um, interaction uh, the user could speak a question 
and a, a normal person, a human person would just listen, understand, and type the reply somewhere. And then we have just a speaker that is only going to read that loud uh, with a mechanical voice, of course. So uh, um, text to speech, uh, um, let's say, uh, technology are much easier uh, to, to, to achieve uh, and uh, less demanding. And so uh, instead of having the real person give the answer, the real person would imagine what the algorithm would respond in that condition type it and uh, a loudspeaker would just uh, um, say speak uh, up the, the sentence that was written by the human user but uh, if this uh, human user is somewhere hidden from from the from the tester from the experimenter uh, then uh, the experimenter really has the impression of speaking with an intelligent uh, device hmm? um, or maybe you are uh, you are uh, designing an in a user interface when you have a lot of machine learning to do to I don't know understand the recommendation the preferences of the system give good suggestions to the users and all of these uh, technologies uh, require a lot of data to be trained okay so for a, a training a recommender you need a lot of people commenting uh, liking or or buying devices or objects and then you have the database for understanding uh, the, the kind of recommendation you can give at the beginning you don't have any of this data but you could uh, fake it with a user that decides manually which recommendation to give according to the last user action in a way the, the wizard so the real person uh, is uh, he, he could be hidden. So the person could not be aware that the real person is doing the job or could be visible. Uh, in any case, it must be revealed, but you decide whether to, re uh, whether to reveal it at the beginning or at the end. So this kind of, if uh, in your project you are, uh, you want to test some technology that you know that will require a lot of implementation, uh, maybe you can uh, think of putting a human in the loop, in the interaction loop, just for testing, of course, just for the prototype testing. And this, of course, uh, will try to simulate uh, high fidelity uh, prototypes uh, in a way, because it's, you are trying to, to reach a higher level of fidelity, a higher level of, uh, of uh, um, uh, similarity of what uh, the real interface would like, look like, uh, and to accelerate the times, uh, instead of implementing for real uh, the, the involved technologies, we are just faking it uh, with a human hidden somewhere behind the curtain or inside the box, uh, or just sitting there on your side, but instructing the, the user that this person is not part, uh, should not be thought as part of the interaction, but should, not, should be thought as a part of the machine. Hmm. Uh, OK, so uh, let's. Uh, Let's just uh, close it here. We don't, uh, we, since we are not involved in that, uh, we don't uh, uh, need to uh, enter into too many details uh, about these techniques. Hmm? Okay, so uh, we are closing the, the discussion about prototypes, uh, prototyping techniques, uh, and we are starting the, the new chapter on uh, design guidelines uh, and theories and principles. Uh, uh, so we are starting actually the, the actual creative phase. Hmm? Uh, in prototyping, we are still the exploration, uh, but uh, also for exploring or for defining or for creating or for making hypotheses of the user interface, uh, uh, we should follow some rules. Uh, we should have some suggestions, some guidelines. Uh, uh, there are no strict rules. There are no strict uh, commandments, uh, uh, but there are a lot of criteria hmm, that we could follow. And these criteria are uh, grouped into three layers. Huh? So uh, just uh, um, this picture tries to remember us uh, uh, what are the key ingredients for, uh, for say, user interfaces. OK, so user interfaces uh, is, uh, of course, uh, needs uh, um, some uh, requirements. So all the neat finding that we did with some observation techniques was already take into account so we know what uh, the users want we started uh, uh, to understand how to build prototypes uh, uh, that will help us uh, in uh, validating the user interface and uh, uh, so this is mainly for say validation we will see also the two right rightmost columns uh, are for validating first uh, the um, ideas with prototypes and later 
the real interface uh, with, uh, um, with the testing uh, techniques that we will study later on. And at the moment, uh, the, the pillar that we are still uh, missing and that we are starting today is uh, having a, a, a design process. A design process that will help us uh, to guide us into the generation process. So we want to start, we start from the requirements. We know what we want to do and how do, or, do we organize it? How we do, do we display the elements and so on? We should have some ideas to create it in the, the interface. Then we can, of course, take, be the prototype for testing our ideas. But at least we have some criteria for creating them. And, uh, and later on, these guidelines will also be the basis for uh, reviewing the interfaces. So first of all, we use them in a generative way in, while creating. And at the same time, uh, more or less the same criteria or similar ones can be used uh, for uh, evaluation of the result. And so this is the topic that we are trying to, to describe now, uh, generating and evaluating design solutions. Uh, the generation is uh, basically uh, made of these three categories, tiers, principle, and guidelines. And I think the guidelines will be the the most uh, critical ones, the most important ones, because they are the most practical ones. Why? For the evaluation, we'll see that in the next chapter uh, about uh, how to use in some way these guidelines uh, in a practical way, in a, uh, in a way that we can, we can use to check or cross-check the, the uh, usability of some, uh, of some prototype or some final design. Um, why are we talking about the three different categories like guidelines, principle, and theories? Basically because they have a different level of abstraction. Hmm? Uh, a theory like the theory of, of, of normal, normal, okay, the gulf of evaluation and the gulf of, uh, of um, execution uh, are very general frameworks uh, that are, have more to do with how the humans uh, work, uh, what, are, what are their cultural backgrounds and so on. So they apply generally, but they don't give a lot of specific information about how to design the, the user interface. They let you understand the why, the why basically. On a more uh, specific case, so uh, these are very general, applicable everywhere, but they are very abstract. So they don't, uh, uh, they don't give you very practical information. Principles are somewhere in the middle. Uh, so they are more uh, more practical. They start to give you some practical information, uh, and but they are applicable only so to some particular cases. So we are principle for web design, principle for mobile design, and so on. And if you go to a specific technology, so maybe a mobile application in Android or a web application with Bootstrap or with a specific framework, so we have a very narrow applicability that. Uh, uh, those rules, those guidelines apply only to that specific case, I don't know, Windows 10 applications, um, but they give you a lot, really a lot of details, really a lot of information in this case. Okay. So um, from the more general to the more practical uh, applicability. So let's start from, from the extra view. So the design theories, just recall them. Uh, there, there are actually a lot of different theories. We won't spend too much time on them, on them because it's a lot of theoretical stuff, let's say, and uh, it doesn't give you uh, real practical knowledge uh, for, for the creation of your design. Uh, so there are theories for, this, for interpre interpretation of the user interface from the user. So how the user is able to understand uh, the meaning of the user uh, interface. Uh, uh, how the user is trying to link uh, with the cause-effect relationship, uh, the, the actions that the user is doing linked uh, with the actions of the user interface, uh, uh, or something more prescriptive that gives the designer some rules to follow, or uh, gives the prediction of what the user would do in a given situation. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, maybe some uh, uh positioning of elements uh, is more efficient uh, than other positionings uh, the size of an element would be larger or smaller and then this would affect the speed of recognition the, it would affect the speed of, of uh, um, operation of clicking on the element uh, and so we can in a way predict uh, how uh, which interface would be more efficient or less for the users so there are a lot of uh, 
um, of these uh, uh, theories uh, for the point of view user interfaces and also they match in a way with theories about uh, the human capacities which are mainly the cognitive capacities but also the motor ones uh, uh, about their uh, perception so how they see and the, and the, and the execution so how they uh, so interact and, and click and enter information uh, one example one big example uh, uh, one of the most important one of is the the normans uh, action model that we already uh, say uh, found uh, in one of the first uh, classes of the course uh, and that gave us uh, no specific information as you recall but they gave us a, a, an instrument a tool to be able to think about what happens when the user is interacting with the system so these theories are at this level in some way you know? they give you a general a general framework for thinking for example uh, this approach by these researchers Foley and Van Damme uh, helps us to understand that the uh, interaction of users with the with the with a user interface happens at many different layers at the same time okay for example they describe uh, the lower levels as a lexical and syntactic uh, syntactic is something like uh, uh, this is a button okay so this element uh, is uh, recognized as a button because of its shape, of its label, and of its color, and so on. And of course, uh, you, you have the concept of a button because at the lower level, you have the, the capability uh, uh, of a device where you can click, when you can select, where you, where you can show some information. And so you put together the capability of the system, which are the basic lexical elements, into a sort of a visual syntax, visual or auditory uh, syntax, uh, made of uh, recurring elements so the words of your interface and uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, this button when it's pressed uh, as a meaning you know, since it's made as a button it's blue or green uh, or gray and it says an okay uh, written into that uh, then if i click on it something will happen so i understand that uh, that is a confirmation button not that any button at all for its position, for its label, from its color, I infer what is its function. And at the higher level, I understand that uh, if I confirm, then the data will be saved. So what is the action of the system state uh, uh, of the interactive system? So we are doing the, all of this uh, very quickly in our mind. But you remember, uh, imagine that every time we, we select something, we click on something, we are going up all the layer. We, first, we see the, the pixels, the shapes. Uh, we put together the shapes into a widget that we recognize. We give a semantics, a meaning to this widget. Is this a slider? Is this a button? Is this a text box? And then we give an, an interpretation, a conceptual interpretation about what we'll do, what will happen if we use this widget in some specific way. And of course, at each, at each of these layers, uh, we have different design techniques, different activities, uh, like, for example, how to, uh, you know, uh, give the details of the buttons or the shadow and so on is uh, something which is different, of course, from the lay, uh, how to write the label, which is more semantic, uh, and where to position it and so on. So at each of these layers, there are design activities. Hmm? Uh, some theories. Uh, 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 are very, uh, which I summarize here in one slide, uh, they uh, very strongly uh, work on the concept of, of consistency. And consistency is one of the strongest concepts in, uh, uh, in, the, in the user interface. Uh, sorry, I will go back to answer the, the, the question from, from Davide. What does the syntactic level has to do with the user? Uh, actually, we are uh, creating some widgets let's say to be used by the user so the user should be able to recognize them so in a way we are not uh, uh, we are we assume that the user will be able to recognize a given element on the screen for example and to uh, understand that that uh, is uh, one possible button i will show one example uh, in maybe some slides uh, so i will come back to this okay davide uh, where it would be difficult to, to recognize what is happening on the screen, basically. Uh, um, as we were saying, consistency is a key, hmm? um, 
because uh, our mind tries to make some simple rules of how things work. And uh, so we need to use the same words when we have the same meaning. So when we uh, use the, sa have the same concepts, uh, used one or two or three times, we should use every time the same word, every time the same noun, every time the same uh, action verbs and so on. So that uh, once I started to, to learn a concept, I, it, that will be reinforced every time. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, there should be consistency at every level. So every color should always mean the same. So in, throughout all your user interface, uh, red should have the same meaning everywhere. You cannot have red for highlighting in, in a corner of the page and red for danger on another part of the page. The layout should be consistent. So it's, it, this layout means the spacing, the size of the letters, the kind of icons, uh, the fonts that you're using, uh, the buttons, and so every, everything. When uh, a given visual element is used for a similar purpose, it should look similar. OK, visual similarity should imply semantic similarity should imply the same function. This is, this is one form of consistency. If you are playing with that and you are uh, showing uh, elements uh, of different sizes and of different colors, then you are in some way uh, implying uh, uh, some uh, difference between them. Let me just show you one very bad page, okay? Uh, this one. Uh, this is a, an example of how not to use uh, consistency or how consistency is not used. Because we see a lot of boxes of different colors, for example. And so this is, some, is telling us uh, these colors have a meaning. And uh, these two, the orange ones, uh, should have something in common. And these three, the three blue ones, uh, insegnamenti, laboratori, and, and iscritti, should have something in common. But uh, there is some color similarity, but there's also some spacing similarity. Some uh, objects are, are close to each other and some are far from each other. So why are these three blue that if they are blue, they should have something in common? Why are they scattered in different places on the page? Why are not they close together? OK. And uh, actually, it looks like this blue is a, a slightly uh, lighter than these other blues that looks slightly darker. So should they be considered as different or it's my, just my perception? Uh, or we are, you see, we have a lot of questions here. While I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet 99% that the person that did this page only put some random colors and forgot about that. But uh, it's uh, the similarity or the difference between different elements uh, are speaking to us. Uh, for example, the same happens in this page where we have similar colors in different boxes and we try to group them by color. By the way, the same color that are here are completely ignored and we are using different colors there with different meanings, if any, if any meaning is there. So a very simple uh, example here, but we can find a lot of them uh, around uh, different applications. Um, uh, where that gives us the impression of uh, of disorder of not being able to find our way into the user interface and there are also if you are uh, making a well consistent design where every element uh, is uh, drawn the same way you can also use inconsistency for your own purposes this is a page from github you see that the title the font the size of the titles are the same here here and there. So it's easy to recognize a page with different sections. Uh, the checkboxes are the same, the font size is the same, and so on. Uh, but we have one, uh, one area with, where the border is red instead of being gray. And the buttons are labeled in red instead of being labeled in black. This is telling us something. This is the danger zone. This is the area where the actions are not, uh, cannot be undone basically. Uh, so they are very uh, consistent uh, layout and, uh, and structure of the page. 
And the, in this very consistent layout, uh, a small inconsistency was uh, used on purpose to highlight some elements. So explicitly say, these, uh, be careful, this is different from the others. And so you will spend some time to understand why it is different. Okay, you see that you, you only, you don't need to explain that in any way. Our brain is doing all the work. You don't need any instructions. Hmm? Um, so these are the general principles where consistency is the father of, of all of the, uh, the general theories, I say. And uh, this can be uh, turned into something more practical uh, according to different sets of uh, design principles. And of course, there are a lot of researchers, there are also scientists that are studying that, uh, and uh, each of them is developing their set of principles. So we will have a look uh, at uh, basically these uh, eight golden rules of interface designs, which are one, uh, one set of principles uh, um, that will, it's one of the many possible sets that you find in the literature, and uh, they will us give us some, some details uh, about uh, uh, some more practical application of the general theories. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, first of all, let's just remember that uh, when we are building some interface, we have very many different choices of how to manage interaction, whether with uh, like in a drag and drop way with direct manipulation or by a set of menus or forms or dialogues or uh, commands uh, that we need to remember, like in the command line or in natural language, uh, both uh, written or spoken. And uh, first of all, we should, we should, we should choose uh, which is the main style of interaction of our application. You should not mix too much different styles, okay? Uh, if you are on a desktop, uh, well, probably the paradigm is more that manipulation. If you are on an application, it's mainly uh, choosing uh, common from menus and then uh, using forms and dialogues, uh, say, together uh, for the type of normal applications. If you are in the terminal, usually you are learning some commands, uh, common lines, and so on. Um, so each of these styles has their own set of principles, of course. Um, Norman's principles are also used uh, to form uh, the general framework. Uh, uh, you remember that the, um, the main concern of normal model are these two goals uh, here. And so uh, it was important that every state and every action uh, um, that the interface uh, uh, say makes uh, available to the user should be in some way easy easy to understand and easy to perceive. So it's very easy to view and to, to see and to, under, to understand. And uh, from what you, you see, from the visibility of the interface, uh, you should make yourself a consistent uh, mental image because the interface, the usage of the visual elements in the, in the interface itself is uh, consistent. So if the user interface is consistent, then your mental image of how the system is working will also be consistent. So it's all about making good mapping so that the, 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 the state of the system that is here and the, your mental model of the system that is in your brain should be in some way linked uh, across these two gulfs uh, in the seamless possible way. And this is about communication, hints, uh, uh, simplicity, uh, consistency, and so on. If this doesn't happen, the user can choose the wrong action to do. So they think that clicking on cancel will delete the element instead of just uh, um, aborting the delay, the deletion maybe. Uh, they will not find uh, uh, where to click or where to go uh, because the label is wrong, because the color is wrong, because the icon cannot be understood and so on. Um, may not uh, understand what they want. They want to understand what the interface is telling them because the interface is speaking a language different from what they have. And they can also understand in the wrong way the feedback that they received in some way because the feedback can be confusing. Okay, just remember our general rule and whenever we talk about user failures actually is the interface, user, so is user interface failure. Okay, so the user is never wrong. The user interface, so this is a UI, I, I'm not able to write it, okay? But, uh, okay, you forgive me. 
so starting from these general principles uh, uh, the these rules uh, we'll try to follow them are listed here the so-called eight golden rules for interface design so we are now focusing okay instead of a general principle just okay we have a, an interface to design what are the rules first of all we already mentioned uh, we mentioned the consistency similar situations should lead to similar sequences of actions so confirming something should if it's if in one part of your application you are confirming an action in two steps in another part of the same application you should always should use two steps because the same actions should be done in the same way across your application if the concept is the same then the uh, the, the way to, to accomplish the task should be also similar and uh, when you have a menu try to use the same words the same concepts uh, across all the all the application all the websites same colors same fonts and so on um, uh, except uh, except some uh, okay exception that as we saw in the example of github are used more to attract the attention because they should be the exception that attracts the attention not not a confusion where nothing is consistent everything is consistent ex is consistent except one detail uh, and this is in many cases it's easier to do I, i'm showing you some some examples for example this is a, you you know that probably if you're traveling in torino which is uh, which are the the machine for for um, uploading your credit uh, on the gtt buses okay so when you're paying you you have to recharge your your uh, your your smart card with the new credit with the new uh, uh, tickets that you're buying and you say that uh, you have some instructions here there Basically, we have instructions here, one, and instruction there, two. So one could understand, well, could ask themselves which one is correct. Okay, M but maybe they're saying the same thing. We don't, we don't know. Uh, but what they're saying, oh, sorry, what they're saying is that uh, uh, in the instruction down here, stop it. Uh, sorry. In the instruction down here, it says that you have first to click on the button that is called ricarica. Okay, <clears throat> this is this button with this shape. And okay, first of all, there are two buttons with the same shape. So, okay, we imagine that it should be the, the one which is already lit because the other one is dark. So we don't look at that. And then the label of the button, it should be ricarica. And in this case, the label is attiva titolo and uh, in the other case you can press uh, the, the the rightmost button here and the, the label is info titolo and it's, it's written twice Prem il tasto, press the button info titolo and of course uh, the label in on screen is different from the one we have on the instruction so that's a stupid thing okay the person that did the documentation didn't speak to the people that were doing the the, the programming of the, of the display of the of the interface but this creates some uh some some questions for for you okay but the, is this the right the, the correct one the ricarica is info okay no info info titolo more or less they look like similar but attiva activate and ricarica recharge are they the same action do they represent the same action or not? Hmm? Yes, they do, but you only discover that by trying and with a, a small fear that you are doing the wrong action. Since this also involves money there, okay, when you go there, you are paying for that. So, um, and uh, there's uh, uh, some, some devices that never cease to su surprise me which are elevators, okay, or lifts. Uh, for example, this is uh, the buttons on an elevator. So we all have a mental model of a, of, a, of a building, okay? There are different floors, one, two, three, four. Then you can start by uh, numbering them from ground one, two, three, or you can call one the ground floor, depending on your culture or in your country, small details, okay? Uh, but uh, you have one, two, three, four, five. So in this case, I'm doing a zigzag mental model of how the uh, floors are described. And then I have this other tree, 
items are s and minus one which i really cannot understand what they mean so if i'm following the zigzag r should be below one so maybe it's the ground okay but below the okay so r is the ground floor it's a zero floor this is the sub floor and minus one or should it should be minus two probably so it's below the ground the sub ground okay so i don't know uh, uh, you 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 don't know actually where the these other buttons are leading you because there is no rule that you can make out immediately from the layout of the interface this is an interface without having further instructions uh, this is another interesting one this one I, I was there it was a hotel where minus one zero one two three four five okay i assure you that the building was straight it was normal no? and the there was only one door <coughs> on the elevator it looks like here from this shape that floor two and floor three should be on different sides of the building one on the north and the other on the south side it's not like that somebody just decides that we're putting these buttons in this layout in this strange layout with no real reason there were no semantics behind this position this is a, an inconsistency with no semantics behind they're not even trying to save space because if you just align them vertically, they would do, use the same amount of space. And what's interesting, it's even worse than the, the, the previous example, because here there is somebody who decide this uh, distribution of the button. Somebody else took a, a, a sheet of, uh, of, of metal and they cut the holes in these right positions. So it's not something that, okay, we have the holes, we put the buttons, uh, okay, we, we just throw the buttons in without any 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 further, any further thinking. Here we are cutting some holes in some strange position and nobody asked why, basically. Nobody asked why, or, or whether it was a good idea to do that in, in that way. And this one is also more interesting because really, uh, I don't know, I... I I found it on, on, on Twitter, but probably it's it's really uh, one minus two, two minus three, minus four, four minus five, five, six, uh, seven, minus seven, eight, uh, minus eight. So uh, don't don't ask me to to try any kind of interpretation of that. Okay. Um, so that's something that uh, will uh, stop us in understanding there's a lack of, of consistency remember the rule was here striving for consistency and here we are striving for the opposite of consistency and this is also the the picture that i wanted to show to davide uh, as before uh, i found this on uh, on um, on a website i don't remember which one but i took the the, the snapshot of this button order timing later and now hmm? uh it was something okay now we remember for um scheduling a, um, a poll hmm? a normal poll where you know, people can choose some options and uh, uh this button was used to choose whether i wanted to run the poll now immediately or schedule it for later okay and these are a lot of there's a lot of confusion here uh, so uh are these buttons do they look like buttons Mm, yes and no, hmm? uh, because they the, they are not separate buttons. There's only one. It looks like one button, but it has two colors inside. Inside, so it should be two two things. So it could be probably one of these, uh, like the the slider selectors. Okay, like uh, you have, for example, on your mobile, uh, some selector like that. Okay, that has a, an on and an off position. But the difference is that in this case, you have a container and you have the slider that can be in two positions and it's clear in which position you are. In this case, is the selected position the white one, the white background and blue text, or is the selected position the, the blue one? If I had three buttons like this, it would be easy. Because if this was blue, 
and the other two was, were white, then I could infer that the selected one is this one. If, uh, uh, sorry, the first two were blue and the third one was white, then I could infer that the selected one is the third one, the one that is different. But if I only have two and there is no stronger, you know, uh, signal that one is the other, I don't have any criteria for choosing whether white is the highlight color or blue is the highlight color. Maybe I could look around in the page to see if some similar items can give you me some information, but just from this snippet, from this syntax, I cannot understand what is happening here. How am I am supposed to use this element? And there's another confusion about uh, uh, the, the selected one, sorry, the label of the selected element. Uh, does it represent the current state or does it represent uh, the uh, the state where we are going to? And it's always uh, it's always a, a, um, a, an ambiguity uh, in these cases. So when you are saying like this, uh, on or off, it's clear that in this position is wrong. And if I want it off, I just should click it here. Uh, and so we have, but we have two separate indications. One is uh, the actions that we want to do, and the other is the current state. But when we mix everything together, and so we have something like uh, maybe you, you have seen it on like that. Okay. So does it mean that, and this is colored? and the other is in the background color. So does it mean that the current state is on? Or does it mean that if I click on it, uh, I'm ordering the on action? It's, a, it's not easy to, to get, OK? It depends on a lot of, of, uh, of other details. Uh, and so it's very easy to, to fall in this kind of traps. Something that looks nice, uh, but from a person who is different from the designer, it does some. It can decide uh, immediately between the two options. Uh, also, because different operating systems uh, have different conventions about uh, this kind of, uh, of, of items. Um, the second principle is uh, universality. Okay, universality means that uh, there are users uh, with different needs. Needs would come from maybe their disability, their uh, uh, visual uh, acuity, uh, the speed of reaction, the context in which they are doing. So if I'm something, trying to see something on a, on a mobile phone uh, or outside with the sun uh, shining, I cannot see many of the details. Uh, I, if I'm sitting on my couch, uh, maybe uh, the, the, the interface should, uh, I can get much, many, much more, uh, many more details uh, about the interface. So in some way, uh, the interface and the contents should be able to adapt to the device, uh, to the magnification level that the user is choosing, and, and so on. And uh, some users are uh, more expert than others, so I want to see more options in a program. And other users, users that maybe are more novices, uh, they want to see less options, not to be confused. So how to follow users that have different degree of expertise? different age, different uh, uh, familiarity with technology. So there is one uh, line of action that, which is called, it's called a responsive design that will help us adapt to the size of the user interface. But it's not, not just a matter of size. Of course, size is important, but also it's magnification, but also is uh, experience, which are important attributes that we should be able in a way to accommodate different levels of expertise, different levels of uh, magnification, different screen sizes, and so on. And of course, uh, international uh, variations where you know the, the, the meaning of uh, uh, white and red colors uh, in the Western countries is totally different inverted from the meaning of red and white in the, in the Eastern uh, countries and cultures like in China, for example. So we also be care, um, should, should be careful in using some conventions that may not be universal enough for everybody to understand in the same way as we do. 
feedback feedback is also very important every action that we do on an interface should provide uh, some kind of feedback feedback could be just a, a button that is sunking a bit when i click it it moves a bit it becomes gray or it becomes uh, uh, it pops up when I'm hovering over it, so I'm, it's confirming that the, this button is active and is ready to be clicked, or it's being clicked right now. It can be a small sound. It can be something changing on the interface and so on. If you are clicking somewhere and nothing change, changes visually or acoustically, you are assuming that your action was not received by the system. And so you are trying to do it twice or, or three times and so on. And so, uh, of course, depending on the kind of action, the, the, the feedback should be subtle, should be small, uh, should be non-intrusive, or should be stronger. Okay, if I'm, uh, you know, uh, closing an order on a shopping website, I want a strong feedback that your order is now um, confirmed. And there's a, a whole page on the website that will tell me this a, a feedback made by an entire page if i'm just selecting a checkbox on a search interface i just want this, the checkbox to become selected or maybe some uh, uh, the column where i'm sorting the elements is becoming bold the title of the column is becoming bold or the column itself has a different background so it's a smaller type of feedback because the action is less important so we should graduate the type of feedback but no user action should be uh, without the feedback and uh, a lot of uh, visual tricks uh, are helping in this kind of feedback even small ones uh, but we really get accustomed to that so we don't we don't realize how much we rely on this kind of feedbacks hmm? uh, this is a one sort of a feedback that of course is not very useful uh, because it's telling some error happened uh, and closed and so it, it's telling me that something was wrong but it didn't tell me what went wrong and how should I correct it hmm? okay uh, but one positive example is this one for example um, there were I downloaded um, Visual Studio Code and uh, I wanted to uh, install this Visual Studio Code uh, as a, for the, all the users in the, in the same machine. Okay, so instead of installing them in my um, personal folders like uh, slash users slash username, and usually by default it will install there. I I wanted to install that in the program files folder. Okay. Um, because I don't like too much to clutter my personal folders because I delete them too often, basically. And so a lot of uh, uh, setup programs, if you run them as administrators, they will install the program for all the users on the system. In this case, it's working differently. So uh, the, when I try to do this action for installing Visual Studio, it's saying the, an error message is very, very informative. The user installer, so first of all, it's telling me that this is the user installer. And of course, there's the user word here, but I didn't care, I didn't notice at the beginning. Uh, it's not meant to be run as administrator. So it's telling me what I did wrong. And it's telling me how to correct it. If you would like to install uh, for all the users, download the system installer from this address. uh and so it's telling me what i did wrong why and how to correct the error the last part is the only one which is not very clear to me so do you want to continue yes or cancel okay or cancel so if i continue what will happen will i install the program in user mode or will i go to the download side of this application so this is not uh, this is okay uh, uh, I would have uh, written uh, install anyway or install for the user or something like go to the website just to be clear or what happens when I click on go. So this is the only part that I don't like too much, but all the rest is perfect. It's giving me useful feedback to avoid the error next time and to understand why something is wrong. So it's the basic opposite of this one. 
and I remember that the feedback, uh, uh, these uh, maybe some of you were already born when we were using uh, basic uh, as programming languages. I remember the first feedback uh, of the programs were something like this. No, uh, I don't know if you ever saw this message, redo from start, which was the automatic message that the in basic interpreter gave you when you entered uh, some string when actually the program was, uh, was expecting some number. So this was an automatic feedback. You could not do anything about that and redo from start. And maybe only after a while you could you understood what actually the program was trying to tell you. Okay. Now, of course, we are, we understood that giving proper feedback is is important. Um, dialogues, dialogues and forms. Okay. A lot of uh, our activity on websites is made of interacting with dialogues, interacting with forms, uh, interacting with menus, and so on. And uh, uh, in most cases, the task that we want to achieve is not concluded, cannot be concluded in just one dialogue, just one window, okay? If you are you know, posting something on, on Twitter or on Facebook, it's easy. You write a text, uh, put on uh, click on post, and it's over, basically. Uh, but in many other cases, uh, uh, so it's a very small type of form, which only one action, which is an atomic one. But in many other cases, uh, the form we need to collect uh, different data, and you can go forward and can go backward. Uh, backward, uh, some validation errors may happen, so you must, must revisit all data and so on. And uh, finally, you you close the interaction when you reach the goal, when you are clicking on the last uh, confirmation done finish button that is in the, on the last page of a sequence of forms. So basically. Uh, in every sequence of actions that involves an interaction with one or more forms, uh, the user should understand whether it's beginning a new task. So the user should know that, okay, I'm beginning a task uh, that is composed of many steps. I know that. I should be aware of that. The interface should, should show me that. Maybe with a different point, one, two, three, four, five, at the, at the top or at the bottom, saying, okay, there are five steps. You are at the beginning of the first one. How it develops across the different steps, and and especially important when it's finished. So throughout all the filling of this information, I'm still in an intermediate state when I'm preparing information. But the last step is the uh, action, the real action, where the real action comes when I do the final confirmation. The data is entered, the order is shipped, uh, and, and so on. So it should be very very clear that all the interaction should progress from a beginning stage where the user has the visibility over what is going to happen through intermediate stages until we have a final stage where it's clear that the user action right now is different. So maybe if you have a forward and backward buttons for moving through the different intermediate stages, the last one should not be labeled forward but finish, for example. So it will change the color, it will change the labeling to show that that final button has a different meaning, has different semantics than from the all previous uh, intermediate buttons. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that uh, all of you have this experience with this uh, set of uh, uh, long forms. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, at the end is a special informant that important that you're providing a comprehensive feedback about the collection of, of all the action that the user did. And so in this way, the user is one, it's sure that the task is completed, so he can forget about that. He can forget about, let's say, so-called working memory where he's thinking about the action that he's currently doing. Okay, it's marked, it's done. Let's move to the next step. Let's move to the next task. And uh, again, we have an example of uh, cases in which this is not uh, really clear. So this is an example of the water dispensing machine uh, in, that we have in, uh, here in Torino. There is one at Politecnico. It's not actually this one, but it's an identical one. And uh, uh, there were, uh, it was a simple machine when you just have to put your card here and uh, push the button here to get water. Then they added the, the payment with credit card with a post here. And okay, it's good, maybe useful. And these are the instructions for using this post. 
So I am sure that a lot of people will never bother reading all these instructions and trying to understand them. And uh, uh, by the way, the picture that is shown here, you see that we have the button and the post reader on the right of the button. Why in the real machine it's on the left? Small inconsistency, but may lead into confusion about, okay, but this one is on the right and it's black. So is, this, is it describing the black one, which is the one, or the white one that is on the right? What is more important, the position or the color to match what they see in the picture of the instruction with the, what they see on the reality? And, and then there are you know, a, a very complex operations to, to do uh, three steps, one, two, and three. There are these three different steps, uh, which are really not, 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 not uh, easy to follow. Okay. If you are really committed, you may try it. Uh, but in many cases, you just say, OK, I don't care. Uh, another example of a form without a clear finish sequence. This is again from the Polytechnic. I'm collecting a lot of this. So if you have some nice ones, please send me. I will, uh, I will really use them. Uh, this is a question during the enrollment process. Uh, and it's asking a question, yes or no. It's a normal two button choices, yes or no. But there's no button for confirming here. So. If I click on yes, does it immediately go forward? Or if I click on yes, uh, will a button appear there that will make me confirm the choice? If I click on yes by mistake, can I correct myself later on? Because normally, if I had these two buttons, I'm expecting to be able to play with them. Click one, click the other, and then finally confirm. If, there is, if the action requires no confirmation, I would have uh, probably two buttons, one button with yes, one button with no. So the syntax here is confusing because I used a visual representation that tell me this is telling me, okay, you are making a pre-selection and then you need to confirm that in a, with an implementation that is actually behaving like two buttons. When you are clicking, you're already done. There's no second step. So in this case, you don't know whether the click action here is the first action of a two-step task, click on yes and then confirm, or is the only action of a one-step task. This is not clear. So I don't know whether this is the definite choice, it's the final choice, especially the final one is important. Hmm. Uh, and uh, the other uh, principle here, which is mentioned is about errors. Most of them are about errors in the end. So I want the user to make the right choice. And I help the user in understanding easily what is going to do, what is going to happen, what kind of information I'm showing. But there is one step farther that we could do. Try to avoid the possibility of making error, making it impossible for the user to make a mistake. Well, impossible is a strong word. It will never be possible, of course, to reach perfection in this case. But avoiding the situation in which the user could happen to enter invalid data, to choose the invalid uh, options, and so on. So if I, in a given page, there is a, a button or a link or an option that doesn't make any sense, it should be disabled. So everything that you that you may click at this moment uh, should have a meaning, should be meaningful. If something in, if it's not, me, it's not meaningful in a given context, uh, disable it, make it gray so that it cannot be clicked. So that the user understands that in this context, this option is not applicable. Hmm? This happens uh, in, in a lot of interfaces, okay? But depending on the previous choices, some further choices become enabled or become disabled. Uh, if you are entering some data, so entering data is always difficult, especially if you are on, on the go or if you're not just sitting at the desktop with a keyboard, entering data is always difficult with on-screen keyboards and so on. And the small uh, um, text areas. And in many cases you have, uh, maybe you need to enter a number. And uh, how to avoid entering a letter by mistake? 
what happens is usually you enter the letter and at the end uh, it will mark an error say okay this field is wrong because this should be a number okay but this could have been prevented if you are showing me an on-screen keyboard only show me the number keyboard a mobile this can be done very easily for example or uh, if you are on a, on a desktop or an interface if you are if i'm typing a letter just ignore that or give a little beep or make a little flash or saying, okay, telling me this key in this moment is not valid. Only numbers will be valid. So the wrong input will never reach the text input, the text uh, area. Uh, it will uh, be stopped before. So I'm doing validation before showing the character in some way. Hmm? Or I, if possible, I should let you choose instead of entering. So don't enter data, choose. If I uh, have a list of possible options, let's choose one option among them. So I don't need to enter the data, not enter the information. I just have the full list of all possibilities and choose one of them. And so in any case, I'm trying to ask myself, how can I avoid the user Whenever I, you are trying to validate some some input, user input, uh, okay, usually you, you in our mind the, in, the user input is a dirty information and should be checked, should be validated. And as a programmer, we are used to do a lot of checks about the length, uh, the type of characters, the validity of the day of the input data. Okay, for every check that we do, let's our ask ourselves: Could we avoid from the beginning? the user for doing that mistake for entering that incorrect data should we modify the interface so that this data will be impossible to enter hmm? that is one one constant challenge because it's also uh, not not possible that's a rule that we are trying to follow but not always we can prevent that and so the other the second half of this uh, uh, table is telling me what to do when an error will happen so we can we should prevent the errors as much as possible but if they happen what can we do first of all we need to be able to go back always okay if something is wrong the user should be able to correct it and maybe the user will find that something went wrong only later on on the next screen let's say and we should be able to go back to delete a post that went uh, wrong or to modify some data that they entered uh, incorrectly hmm? uh, every error should be every mistake should be recoverable in some way no? you should never put yourself in the condition of uh, uh, telling the user okay it's too late correct that now it's done you cannot do anything about that okay or be very uh, specific and clear about that like the github is showing the danger zone so we are you will be very careful when you work there and if you are letting the user modify or recover some from server error let them modify only the faulty parts not maybe i enter 27 fields i filled 27 fields and only the third one was wrong don't let me re-enter all of them only the one that were wrong okay in a way so i don't want to start from zero i only want to correct my mistake um, so there should never be just one option for entering information you should always offer possibility of editing that or for deleting data and so on and especially uh, if possible the user error should not uh, modify the application state like it's written here so it should not uh, have an effect on the application. If I'm doing some mistake, I can correct it or I can delete the data and nothing changes, okay? Friends as ever, uh, we, we, it doesn't have any per, a user action, as you, sorry, a user error will never have a permanent effect on the system. So uh, it doesn't affect the system if, I can, if I'm able to check the error before or uh, when I restoring the error, the system state will also be restored back to the previous state as if nothing happened before, okay? So the user should not, never be um, scared of entering some information of selecting some data because it knows uh, that something can be always recovered. You know who is the king of all of this? You know that is uh, Mr. 
control Z, okay, that we expect to work everywhere. Okay, when you're writing a document and you are typing an email or whatever, uh, we always know we can type very fast because we know if something went wrong with control Z and uh, and uh, it will undo you know, the undo action. Undo is a very very powerful concept. It was invented quite late, uh, much later than copy and paste, uh, but actually um, the undo action, the control Z key, uh, removes a lot of confirmation questions. So the user interfaces don't ask a lot of confirmation. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Do you really want to? Yes. Because we are clicking yes without thinking. They are totally useless. Okay because we are, we are learning to click on yes without even reading or without even thinking about what we are doing. So the user interface is letting the user make a mistake, but making it extra easy to correct the mistake, which is much more effective than blocking the user every time there is a slight chance it could make a mistake. No? So in this case, error recovery is more important than error, constant error checking or constant nagging of the user to, to ask the user to check. The user will check when he wants, when he's on the mind, on the mood of checking the errors. And if something is wrong, he will correct. And they should provide the, the opportunity of correcting anytime in the future. I should not uh, force the user to make definite decision. Is it correct? Yes or no. In, and if I click yes, it's done forever. Hmm? No, it's not. Uh, um, is not very efficient. And uh, error prevention, okay? This is a form that is telling me, if, the, if your username, if, basically, if your username is a codice fiscale, it should be entered with capital letters. Okay, so let, let me be clear. First of all, is this website, uh, uh, is, are the logins for the website uh, Codice Fiscale or are they different? Because I don't, I, I don't think that it's sane to have uh, an interface where I can write a, a, maybe an email as the username or a Codice Fiscale, which is a totally different syntax in the same form. It's not clear what I'm expecting here. If it's a college fiscal, and if not, what happens? First of all, but this is the minor part. If it is, it should be entered in capital letters. But you are stupid because uh, you are a computer. If I enter a lowercase letter and lowercase a, you should be able to correct it immediately to an uppercase a. Why are you asking me to read, understand this message? And forcing me to be careful about the capital letters, and imagine on a smartphone, on a smartphone interface, because you have to click on the capital uh, once per letter or click on the sticky one. Because I never, I never sure how to to activate that the caps lock on the mobile. While you could just simply correct them, you receive a, a lowercase a, you just show a capital A. It's just one line of JavaScript or whatever. Uh, to do this kind of correction. And in this case, you don't have to specify anything. Everything will just be displayed in capital letters. Hmm? Uh, this, of course, if the uh, login should be entered as codice fiscale, as in capital letters. Uh, Enrico is telling, yes, but maybe this website also have some usernames that, 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 that contain mixed letters, OK? Uh, yes, one more reason for making two different, uh, two separate login screens. One for entering with one syntax and the other for entering with a different set of identifiers, where the, the rules should be different, of course. Hmm. So uh, you enter that with a si very simple set of rules and the system is helping you to avoid mistakes in that, in that case, right? Uh, you are, if you are doing like this, you are pushing the complexity into the user responsibility. You are saying, I am a stupid programmer. I don't want to work. You work because you are the user. Hmm? 
which is the opposite of usability, basically. OK. Um, a reversal of actions is the general concept, uh, more general concept after error prevention and error recovery. Uh, in general, being able is not always possible because it depends on the application, of course. Uh, but uh, as much as possible, we should think whether our actions or the actions that the user do are in some way reversible. Okay. Uh, if the user can go back one action, even if there is no mistake, okay? In one case, is I made an error, I want to correct it, so let me go back, please. Okay. In the other case, I, I'm doing something. Maybe I'm just exploring what happens if I click here, what happens if I go there, and they want to go back. So if, if uh, you want me to explore your interface, you should make very clear that exploring the interface doesn't do any damage. You can go back at any time without any problem. OK, so any, any action, uh, you can stop before the final confirmation, or you can delete it just right after you enter that. So I want to try to make an order on Amazon. OK, I can make the order because I know that they cancel, I, I may cancel it uh, one minute later or until some hours later. So. Uh, some messaging or some email programs let you unsend a message uh, for a short amount of time after uh, after sending it. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if you are doing some real action on the system, in some cases you can go back and you can explore a different uh, way of doing that. Or maybe you just realized that you didn't want to do that in this way, you wanted to change it, mm -hmm. um, you can do that. And of course, the reversibility can be just a simple, the last action can be changed, or the whole, a whole task uh, could, could be changed. Uh, and so you can undo a lot of uh, activity and restart from scratch um, in a different case. Like, you know, when you, are, you are, when you are enrolling into an exam, you know that this action is uh, reversible. You can delete yourself uh, at any time in the future. So. You're quite clear, you say, OK, just in case I will enroll. Then later on, I will think I have more time to think about whether to delete myself or not. If you had to decide uh, 10 days before whether you are actually going to take the exam, it will, will be much more stressful. You're just putting away uh, forward an action, say, OK, let's say maybe, maybe I will try that. And then later on, two days before, you really decide. And so it's less, uh, it gives you le more options. Of course, it gives more complexity to the system, more complexity to the backend, but more, uh, let's say, less stress uh, to the users. Keeping users in control, uh, it's an illusion. Of course, the user interface is controlled by the computer. Every pixel on the screen is controlled by the computer. But the user should feel like he or she were was in control of that user interface. So um, when I click on a button, I'm not clicking on a portion of the screen, hoping that the system will activate that button, which is what really happens. Okay. In reality, I feel like I'm really pushing that button. Me, myself, my finger. So I click in the mouse, but I really, my finger thinks that it's on the screen. It's on the button, really. Uh, so every action I do, I should feel, I should see the interface respond to that. And if possible, uh, avoid uh, forcing the user to do a lot of complex tasks, uh, because if I want to do an action, I should do, be able to do that uh, in an easy way. Uh, an example of the tedious, tedious task is, for example, when you are selecting an item from a nested menus. So you select the first item, then the second item in a nested menu, and then you move the mouse and everything closes. Okay, and so you have to start from beginning for the beginning. So you are, you are in a way fighting against the interface for finding the right path for click on the element. So it's much better if uh, so you don't feel in control there. You are feeling against the interface. Why, if why I click on a menu that will stay open no matter what, if I also go out. Uh, uh, then it's, it's better because I am in control on when the menu will open, the pop-up menu will open, and when it will close. 
I decide that with my action, by clicking outside, for example, and not just by moving by mistake one pixel uh, too far, and then I have to restart again. Okay. Uh, or uh, having a long list of elements and having to, having to read and tick and check each, each of them uh, manually, okay? Without any help from filtering for grouping or something like that. So that in those cases, the user feels that the user is doing work for the interface, not the other way around. The interface is there and the user should adapt to do a, a nasty task because the interface wants that. And we should try to avoid this situation in which we are putting the user uh, knee down and do some, some actions. Uh, and of course, if the user interface responds, it should respond in a predictable way. Okay. Uh, if I'm clicking uh, on a checkbox, uh, I expect that checkbox to become selected, not another one in another path, part of the page. From the code point of view, there's no difference. Okay, I'm checking the click event and then I'm selecting a checkbox. Okay, I, I must select the right checkbox, the one that the user is really clicking. So there should be no surprises. Uh, the user interface should do exactly what the user expects that to do. And the user is expecting something based on the understanding of the interface and also on the visual, on the syntax and the visual syntax of the elements there. And of course, all the undo, redo, cancel, and confirm actions are part of this, uh, where the user is telling the interface its intention, his intention to continue or to go back or to abandon or whatever. And uh, the other rule is uh, to make it easy for the users always. So make it, making it easy for the user could be the summary of all of these rules. Okay, of course. Uh, one is the uh, user memory. Okay, this is a rule that's telling that people can remember seven pieces of information at a time. Basically, seven plus, plus minus two means from five to nine. So if I'm telling you six numbers or six names, you are able to repeat me those names immediately after. If I'm telling you 10 or 12 of them, in most of the cases, you are not able to, to repeat them after, okay? Probably my capabilities are around two or three, uh, but different people are more or less able at this kind of tasks. But basically, in our mind, we can keep only a handful of information. So we have five fingers. Let's think about five pieces of information that the user can remember. So we should not require the user to remember more than a very few items of information from what he did in the in, in the, the previous steps. You should not remember in page number three of a sequence of forms uh, what is selected in page number one. He cannot remember that. He will probably have to go back unless we show it again in number three. Okay, remember you click this and now this is the reason why I'm asking this question and so on. So in a way we should never require the user to remember on a screen the information that we entered in the previous screen. Very stupid example. I, I have a screen, okay, when you when you enter your name. Okay, so a form, enter your name. Okay, you enter it here. The next screen and the okay, okay. In the next screen, you have to confirm the name. Confirm yes or no. Okay, this is a mistake because uh, uh, in the second screen, you have to confirm the name, but it, you are not seeing it. You must remember which name you wrote in the previous page. You're telling, okay, I, I'm not stupid, I remember my name. Okay, you remember your name, but it's different from remembering exactly what you wrote in the previous page because maybe there was a mistake, a typing mistake. Maybe you were interrupted by a phone call between the first and the second screen. So you really don't remember what you did in the previous page. Confirm, confirm what? Okay. So this is easy to correct. In this case, I have also in this page to enter, to write, confirm the name that you enter that was uh, X, Y, Z or whatever. 
I just show it again. So you don't have to remember it because you see it in front of your eyes. So very simple in this case uh, example, very simple cases where the user doesn't have to remember what he read or what he wrote in the previous page. Um, and, and try to avoid the entry, entry of data as much as possible, especially complex data. So as much as possible, make the user select from lists, uh, select from uh, uh, options instead of entering information that maybe it's, it will be very easy to make it wrong. Uh, there is a, an uncomfortable uh, habit in, uh, in, uh, in current web applications uh, uh, for breaking this rule. So let's uh, think about the, the, the signing uh, uh, procedure for, um, for Gmail, for example, for Google. My, a lot of websites today are made in this way. They are asking the, your username on the first page and you write it here, like that, you write it here. And on the second page, you are asking for the, they are asking for the password. Um, of course, they are reminding you the username that you chose before. Okay, so they are not uh, making you remember, they are showing you, okay, in this case. So what are, you think, the advantage or the disadvantage compared to the old version, like login and password here? And then, okay, the okay button here. This was the old login convention. Every login form was uh, uh, asked you to enter username and the password on the same screen. And right now, many websites are splitting that experience in two. Um, well, first, one, one reason, of course, is uh, mobile devices. This full, this big screen would not fit into mobile devices. Or the user will not be able, maybe in many cases, to see all the page up to the to the confirmation button at the end. And so they want to split it uh, to make it fit better on, on, on the smartphone screen. So one piece of information at a time. Matt is saying, is suggesting that maybe for, for security reasons, uh, I, I don't see what is the difference in security uh, between the two aspects because in this, after this next, uh, I already have in this page the username and the password. Okay, so uh, all the information that I, that I had in the in the on the old login form is in the second step of the new login form. So I think the security more or less is the same. Uh, Andrea is, tell, is saying, suggesting if the user is automatically authenticated, uh, well, in this case, it will skip everything. It will skip uh, uh, both steps. Okay, so it will uh, not see a signing form. The signing is shown if the if you have not uh, automatic authentication in some way. Hmm. Um, Dario, no, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, you are suggesting that you are uh, avoiding typos in the email. So that the wrong email will not let you continue to the next string. No, this would be a very uh, huge security problem. Uh, if I'm writing a wrong email, wrong here, we, we, the user interface will uh, ask me for the password. It will never check, or at least it will never tell me if the email was wrong, because that would be a very, a very easy way to. Uh, um find valid users on a system now, you should never tell a, a user uh, as, a, as a part of the error this login is wrong you should always tell that the, the combination of login password is inconsistent so you will never know if the login is right and the password is wrong or if the login doesn't exist at all so in the, even if you enter an, a non-existent email uh, you will again, it will in any case uh, be uh, taken to the second page where you have to enter a password, even if the system already knows that the user doesn't, ex doesn't exist. Okay. Because otherwise, you, you could, you know, delete that, that username because it doesn't exist. And so all the list of passwords and username that are in the dark web will be much easier to validate. Hmm? Uh, there can be multiple accounts, of course. 
but what's wrong with this? What's wrong with putting the the you know the drop down list here even here? Like we have here, okay, in the second one. So really, it, there are two different design choices. I'm sure that the people of Google had, they did extensive checks, extensive experiments uh, to to decide uh, which one, which way to go. Of course, one is the strong push of mobile devices. The other is uh, clarity. The user, one step at a time. The user here only has to think. They are thinking. They are targeting. May use stupid, non-expert users. So here they only have to enter their email. That's it. And if they don't, they don't remember the email, they tell you that they forgot the email. Then you will ask about the password, and they only have to think about the password. And if they don't forget the password, they will tell you that they forgot the password. So we are treating users as, as, as stupid, basically, OK? But uh, these forgot email and forgot password are in the right place. Here, in the, in the old login form, you really didn't know what to write uh, for forgetting the password. Because if you say, forgot the password, maybe I don't remember the login. So usually, you were taken to a separate page where you have to enter. If you remember your login, please, uh, your uh, yes, login or your email, enter it. If you don't remember it, you have a different procedure to go. And so the handling of the error or the forgetting of the of the login instructions uh, was more complex. Here you are guided more step by step, uh, in a way. Uh, and also the register action here is a create account. It's also hidden here. It doesn't appear anymore there. And here it will be another button here. So you have a three options here. Okay. Uh, I forgot something or register a new account. And so it will become more complex to operate and probably while expanding the user base from you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people to millions or tens of millions of people, what we want uh, is a, an user interface that has less choices, less chances to be misunderstood or less chances to click on the wrong button by, by mistake. So simplification in this case. Uh, also, there's uh, all the single sign-on uh, uh, stuff uh, where if you enter the name, uh, for example, we have a link between uh, the Google applications and Polytechnico. So if I enter an email of Polytechnico, it will give it will lead me to the login page of Polytechnico where I enter the password on the Polytechnico website instead of Google. Okay, so this is another option of filtering the second step according to the identity provider. And the identity provider will be detected in the first step. Could be also a reason, one of the many reasons. Okay, so but it's not an obvious choice. Uh, it's we, we can argue for and against uh, each of these uh, options, and we should act really be into the specific context to understand uh, which choice is better. We trust that these guys here at Google did uh, a lot of uh, uh, extensive tests, uh, and at the end they decided the second one probably wasn't uh, slower or significantly slower, but it uh, reduced uh, a lot of mistakes. And those metrics probably let them decide uh, for making that the standard uh, options. Mm -hmm. So even small things, uh, there's a lot of hidden, uh, say, thinking. Or let's start to, I'm trying to push you to start noticing all the details uh, in the website that you are visiting in the application that you're using. OK, tomorrow we will continue the discussion. Sorry for being a little over my time um, by going to more practical issues, more practical instruction about how to translate these principles into you know, practical rules uh, according to different uh, types of technologies. So for today, that's all. Thanks for being with me. And uh, we see you tomorrow at uh, 11.30 in the morning. Bye-bye. Thank you.